with a, um, a solar project based on RECs, will a bank take that risk? Uh, will an investor, if we went to nearest capital, would they take that risk? Um, so at this stage, I think the, the jury is out in terms of how and when um, the RPO stroke REC market will actually deliver real power to the consumer. But I think it will happen. Um, I think it's going to be a bit of an Indian wedding in terms of we'll get there in the end, but we might be messy and noisy getting there. Um, but it, I think it's a really clever initiative. Nakul, you've been in the carbon space for long, and I mean, you probably are the best to understand REC. Uh, that's additionality in this generation, but I mean, your thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think it's extremely important to understand enforceability. Uh, you know, from an from a investor perspective, from a valuation perspective, if, you know, we will not, as of now, uh, consider REC mechanism in the whole play, which is extremely important because, you know, it is a, a, a pretty important piece of uh, policy uh, to accelerate solar power in the country. Um, and there are obviously uh, open issues in terms of would you get carbon credits versus RECs, you know, versus CDM, can you get both, can you not get both. Um, the, other, the other open areas for RECs are clearly they can't be bankable or there are no arbitrage opportunities available for players outside uh, you know the 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 final uh, seller and the final buyer unlike carbon which you can you know bank and and trade uh, this is purely from you know RECs are are generated and they're sold to the ultimate buyer and they have an expiry period which is pretty short um, so how do you try and uh, bank them for various purposes it's not only arbitrage purposes but various planning purposes as well um, so clearly, there's enforceability, there is evolving uh, uh, understanding and maturity in the whole REC market. Can they be fungible internationally? You know, if, what if you have additional uh, RECs? How can you, you know, send them outside for your obligations for, for power plants outside the country? Um, but again, uh, it's a new market. It's, it's exciting. India is one of the key players uh, internationally to adopt this. Uh, and we expect the policy to evolve much faster. Uh, but unless enforceability is, is uh, not done, this market will literally collapse. Rupa, any thoughts? Any additional thoughts on that? I think I, I echo what Nakul and Alan said. I think for us as an investor, it's great to see the, the start of this. It's great to see the framework that has been set up. Uh, but we would treat it differently and we would consider it as a substance when it comes to uh, evaluation or anything else. Uh, once that enforceability is understood, and like Knuckle mentioned, once that relationship of carbon credits versus RECs is understood, but the framework has been fantastic. It, it means that things are moving in the direction that everybody wants. Uh, like Alan mentioned, it'll make projects that would otherwise be hard to make viable, would make them you know, very viable. So it's, it's a great, important part of the whole system working together. I mean, Alan, uh, there are two technologies in solar, I mean, broadly the PV and the CSP space, and I mean, there's been a lot of debate whether our mission should have uh, fixed uh, quotas for each of them or it should be open to the market, and there are thoughts that CSP is going to be eventually utility scale and PV is, uh, you know, off-grid off and things like that. I mean, what's your take on that as a developer? I'm sure you've done your homework before you chose uh, PV. So, I mean, what are the drivers in PV for you? Well, we, we haven't chosen PV. It just happens our first two projects, one at NSM, one under Gujarat policy, happen to be PV um, because the numbers work and um, uh, the projects are clearly bankable given the, the, the structures. We were very interested in CSP. Um, we did a lot of work on it in the last um, 18 months, um, but we did not feel able to make to put together a, a bid under national solar mission. Um, we couldn't get the numbers to work and we couldn't get the, the risk uh, assignments correct. Uh, I wish those people who did bid and won uh, success in implementing the projects and critically their first uh, um, critical step of achieving uh, financial closure on those projects. Um, in my own view, and I, I declare an, um, a certain prejudice in life, I used to advise a conservative British Prime Minister, so I have a certain view of the way the world works. Um, I do not think the government should be making technology choices. I do not think the government should be restricting access to technology in the way that it is. I don't think the government should be forcing us to buy Indian manufactured product when something from the US or China might be more economic and more favorable um, to the end consumer. What we should be is trying to get the lowest cost power in the most sustainable way. I also happen to believe that India is, is the world's best place to manufacture. 
So I think manufacturing industry is going to come, just as it has in, in solar, in, in wind and thermal now. Uh, we don't need protectionism uh, in order to have a great PV industry here, a great CSP industry here, and I hope new technologies that no one's thought of. So I don't think necessarily it's just a choice between PV and CSP. There will be new types of technologies. They could be hybrid. They could be things which are uh, distributed. I think it's going to be a very interesting area, distributed solar uh, CSP. Um, I don't know, but if I don't know, I'm not sure the government necessarily knows either. That leads us to the next question. I mean, Chandra, I mean, you've done uh, work on distributed, and there's a lot of talk about now microgrids and uh, distributed and off-grid and how those three can go hand in hand. And can you just tell us a little bit about that? No, clearly, uh, there have been attempts of late in the last couple of years at uh, creating micro-generation, uh, micro-networks. I mean, it's basically been facilitated by the changes which are made in the Electricity Act and the 2003 Act basically now today lets people to set up uh, separate grid networks uh, because at this point in time they, they realize that it, public money can't be taking us everywhere. I mean, because we are almost around 100,000 villages have zero, close to zero access to electricity and close to 400,000 villages have uh, less than six hours of electricity at any point in, 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 in any day. So clearly there has to be in the, uh, there are a lot of incentive for private production and private distribution in initiative we have basically looked at technologies which can become potentially viable in indian conditions what are the potential bottlenecks and we have tried to address this as part of a report so hopefully they will implement it in the as they roll out the policy not necessarily at the policy level because they can't go and change policy every year or every second year or in the second rollout phase so uh, i think Policies are well intended at certain points in time, but there are times when uh, it's not given a lot of thought, and and I think that's where the problem arises. And I think if we can, uh, if we can make uh, well, bridge that particular gap, I think it can probably work very well. Given this, I mean, one more question. The last question. Oh, oh, yes. A sort of obvious corollary to the question on uh, government uh, policy and its role. What about uh, the role of carbon trading, renewable energy certificates, and so on, and uh, the pricing of those, how important are they uh, in making projects viable or unviable in the renewable energy area? I think, like someone said before, uh, there's such a need for power here that the need of, for capital of any kind is important. So if this is another way that it's another funding source that can come to a developer to make a project uh, more viable, to make the capital cost be more accessible, then it's important. I think that for these to work, there needs to be more comfort, not just around the pricing, like we talked about before, the enforceability of it is very important. So understanding what do these mechanisms actually mean, uh, what kind of uh, comfort do we have in that pricing and what kind of visibility do we have into how the pricing might change when it does is just as important. So I think absolutely any form of capital that can help to bring about the amount of power that we need to hit the targets that we've talked about is welcome and is important. Uh, but I think that there needs to be the natural evolution of the clarity of these mechanisms and how they'll work is something that I think everyone is eager to see. Quick uh, uh, addition to that. Um, see, the prices, price bands which are fixed for both solar and non-solar based RECs were fixed basically to make these uh, technologies viable. And that is the reason why a solar REC is priced at a much higher pr price point, at, at a much higher price point. And these also follow a lot of international standards, like, you know, for example, so Australia has a, RE a REC mechanism where they have a cap, they don't have a floor. Here in India, I think we have a floor and a cap. Okay, so there are mechanisms which have been studied across the globe and they have tried to come up with it to make it viable. So there is a lot of thought gone, gone into it, but whether one specific technology is viable or not viable, it definitely adds to the viability of the project. Um, you know, honestly, in, when I started in the carbon markets in 2005, uh, I thought carbon credits are going to save the problems of capital in the world. Um, uh, clearly, uh, it is not even remotely close. So one thing we need to realize very, very clearly that carbon credits, CERs, RECs are extremely ancillary 
right now to the whole project economics. Uh, RECs have the potential to try and become substantially, again, ancillary substantial, uh, once the system evolves. Uh, enforceability comes into place. Um, but uh, there is, you know, at, at a much larger level, uh, there are more uh, political international forces at work. You know, there needs to be agreement internationally uh, for, for fungibility to work uh, across the world because it, it's very difficult for such mechanisms to work in isolation. Uh, so we are, we are still far away um, from, from a fledging market, but yes, there will be in, in the next, you know, five, seven years, a very robust um, uh, uh, carbon credit or emission trading or REC uh, trading market uh, supporting the economics of such projects. We'll uh, draw the session to a close and we'll take the questions offline. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd request Vineet to please hand over uh, a small memento to the entire panel.